Buenas tardes a todos. Bueno, tengo el honor y gracias por la invitación de presentar a la profesora Londa Schivinger, que junto con todas las mujeres que me rodean acá y que tengo sentadas alrededor, son pioneras en los estudios de género y ciencia y salud eh, y nos abrieron un camino que esperamos poder seguir llevando adelante durante muchísimo tiempo. La profesora Londa Schiebinger es profesora John L. Hintz de Historia de la Ciencia en la Universidad de Stanford. Es también directora del proyecto de innovaciones de género de la Unión Europea y los Estados Unidos en Ciencia, Salud, Medicina, Ingeniería y Medio Ambiente. Es una destacada experta internacional en género, en ciencia y en tecnología y ha asesorado a las Naciones Unidas sobre el tema género, ciencia y tecnología. Es miembro electo de la Academia Americana de Artes y Ciencias y ha recibido numerosos premios, incluido el prestigioso Premio de Investigación Alexander von Humboldt y la beca Guggenheim. Su trabajo en innovación de género aprovecha el poder creativo del análisis de sexo y género para mejorar la excelencia y la reproductibilidad en la ciencia y la tecnología. Una de sus últimas publicaciones, más notables, es la que salió publicada en la revista Nature sobre la necesidad de que los científicos en computación identifiquen las fuentes del, sexo, del sesgo sexista en los datos que utilizan, remuevan este sesgo y desarrollen algoritmos de inteligencia artificial que sean robustos al sesgo. Eh, agradecemos la participación. Thank you, Londa. Y bueno, eh, empezamos entonces la conferencia titulada Innovaciones de Género en Ciencia, Salud y Medicina, Ingeniería y Medio Ambiente. Gracias. Hi, uh, I'm very happy I can be with you virtually today. I wanted to be there in person, but as you may have heard, I, I was hit by a car recently um, and <laughs> so I can't be there, but um, And I also have some mouth damage, so please bear with my speaking. I'll do as, as, as clearly as I can. So I'm pleased today to introduce you to Gendered Innovations, a global initiative that develops sex and gender analysis in research. Gendered Innovations was produced through a large international collaboration involving over 200 basic scientists, engineers, and gender experts. This is so important that granting agencies in Europe, Canada, North America, and in South Korea have changed policy to include sex and gender analysis in uh, asking that applicants include it in their research when they're applying for money from like our National Science Foundation, from the European Commission. So this is very important. And we've now expanded into Japan, South Korea, South Africa, and I hope soon, well, I know you're all working in Argentina. So now I'm going to share my slides. And I don't know if you can then see me or not, but uh, you can see what's here. Okay. So the operative question is, can we harness the creative power of sex and gender analysis for discovery. Does considering gender add a valuable dimension to research? Does it take research in new directions? So first a bit of background, which I'm sure you all know, but I think it's good to ground us in this. Governments, universities, and increasingly corporations have taken three basic initiatives to equality over the past several decades. The first is fixing the numbers of women which is about participation. It's about gender equality, diversity, and inclusion in research careers. It's about recruiting more women and underrepresented minorities for science and engineering careers. The second is fix the institutions, which is about institutional transformation, uh, transforming research organizations so that both men and women's and gender diverse individuals' careers can flourish. And the third is Fix the Knowledge, which is about sex and gender analysis in research, or as I like to call it, gendered innovations. This is the newest and the most important for the future of science, engineering, and innovation. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So let's dive in. Doing research wrong costs lives and money. For example, 10 drugs were withdrawn from the US market because of life-threatening 
health effects, and eight of those pose greater threats for women. Not only did drugs cost billions of dollars to develop, but when they fail, they cause death and human suffering. We can't afford to get the research wrong. But doing research right can save lives and money. And I wish I had more metrics on this. If any of you have metrics, it becomes a very powerful argument. But this kind of information is hard to get. So I highlight the one study we have. Uh, this is the Women's Health Initiative, which was a large government trial in the United States at NIH um, on whether or not postmenopausal women should have hormone therapy. And for the answer is no. And for every dollar spent in research, $140 were saved for US taxpayers in health savings. And there were health improvements. There were fewer uh, heart attacks, fewer breast cancers, and more quality adjusted life years. So that's what gendered innovation attempts to to do, it's crucially important that we get the research right from the very beginning. And this is the goal of gendered innovations. We, so we're 10 years old now, I mean, it's kind of exciting. We develop state of the arts methods for sex and gender analysis, and we provide case studies to illustrate how gender analysis has led in many cases to discovery and innovation. And in the next few minutes, I want to share uh, some quick examples with you of how sex and gender analysis leads to discovery in stem cell research, uh, in uh, machine learning, robotics, and I hope we have time for menstrual cups. <laughs> but first, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I'm sure you are. Uh, so sex is about biological characteristics, height, weight, genes, hormones. Gender, by contrast, is about cultural attitudes and behaviors. And importantly, sex and gender interact from the very beginning of life. Um, so the social aspects interact with the biological aspects to give us who we are as an adult. So my first example of how sex and gender analysis can enhance science uh, comes from stem cells. So let's go back to why 10 drugs were withdrawn from the market. There are many reasons why drugs fail and fail more often for women. And one reason is that most research is done in males, whether in humans, animals, or cells and tissues. This study was done in 2011 by some of our colleagues at Berkeley, and it shows the sex of the animal used in the research the blue here indicates that males are used more often than females. The red is the females. And you can see that in all areas except for reproduction and immunology, male animals are used mostly in research. But what I'm interested in is this gray area where the sex of the animal is not recorded. This is research money wasted. You can't use this data for analysis, you might as well throw the money out the window because it's useless if the sex of the animal is not recorded. A similar study was done at Mayo Clinic on the sex of the cells used in research. And here you can see it's mostly gray area. Mostly the sex of the cells has not been reported. And this again is research money wasted. So now I wanna to go to uh, the Gendered Innovations website. So I'm going to unshare my screen and then share my website. And here we go. So this is the website. I hope you're using it. It's a public, publicly available, public usable website. And here are all of our methods, our terms and our case studies, which I'm going to talk about. We have them in four buckets, four areas, science, health and medicine, engineering and environment. And I want to talk right now about stem cell research. And uh, there's a Spanish translation <laughs> of the website as well, as you all know. So um, you can get that too. 
So let's go to stem cell research. Why might, why might the sex of the cell be relevant in stem cell research? Researchers show that there are sex differences in the therapeutic capacity of stem cells. So we see here XX or female stem cells are more active, more regenerative than the XY stem cell. Yet very few researchers consider the sex of the cell and this can lead to failed research. An international research team from Norway and Australia was working with stem cells in mice and they appropriately used both male and female mice, but when it came to the stem cells, they used all female stem cells and this was an unconscious and arbitrary decision. It means that in the discovery phase of their research, they didn't see anything unique to the male stem cell nor did they detect important differences in function between the male and the female cells. So the result of not considering the sex of the stem cells meant that all of their male mice died and they didn't know why. They thought maybe a postdoc made a mistake, when in doubt, blame the postdoc. But they found through a gendered innovation workshop in Norway, the team realized that they needed to consider the sex of the cell as well as the sex of the animal. And they found that for their research, sex matching worked the best for uh, cell and animal. So matching male to male and female to female, but you have to try all of the, it's called research. You have to try all of the combinations before you can rule any out. Now you should know that this is important for human organ transplant as well. I hope none of you ever need a heart transplant or kidney or lung, but if you do, you need to get the best science on the sex matching. So usually it's male to male and female to female, but not always, so do the research. But then there's a gender, so that's the sex of organ transplant, but then there's also a gender issue, and that is that even if the surgeon knows the best science, in relationship to sex, the surgeon may not be able to get the organ. More women donate organs for transplant in the United States in any case. And so um, in many cases, the surgeon cannot choose the organ but has to take the one that is available. So we have a sex issue here and also a gender issue that's very important. Um, so before moving on to technology, I want to make just a, a, a couple of general points. Gendered innovation is about enhancing excellence in science. So getting the research right. It's also about innovation and discovery, seeing new things. It's about social justice and equality, making sure that the outcomes of research work for everyone across society. And for corporations, we have to realize it's also about profitability their devices and products will be taken up better if they consider sex and gender analysis and make them work for everyone. Okay, so now I want to turn to engineering and I'm going to speak specifically, you can see all of our case studies here. Uh, I'm going to speak specifically about machine translation. So I'm sure you use machine translation all the time, I do, um, and it's a very helpful and useful tool. So I start with a, a little story. Some years ago, I was in Madrid and I, I was interviewed by some Spanish newspapers and I don't read Spanish, I read French and German and other languages. So when I returned home, I put the articles through Google Translate and I was shocked that I was referred to repeatedly as he, Londa Schiebinger, he says, he thought and occasionally it wrote. How can such a cool company as Google have this masculine default? How can they make such a fundamental error? Google Translate defaults to the masculine pronoun because the ratio of he said to she said on the internet is a ratio of four to one. It peaked at four to one in 1968 and has now dropped to a ratio of two to one uh, since the 2000s. 
This is a huge cultural change shifting toward more equality from 1968 to the year 2000. And we know what else happened in this period from 68. If you're my age, you remember these, these periods. There was a huge women's movement, which changed our use of language to inclusive language, he and she. Um, and uh, also a lot of the government agencies started uh, funding more research for women in science and trying to increase the number of women in science. So with one algorithm, Google wiped out 40 years of cultural change and they didn't really mean to. This is completely unconscious gender bias. So the fix, a couple of years ago, Gendered Innovations invited experts from Google and Stanford to a workshop. They listened for about 20 minutes and they said, we can fix that. So fixing is great, but constantly retrofitting for women or gender diverse people is not the best road forward. I had to ask myself, how is it that these Google engineers, many of whom are educated at Stanford at my own university, how did they get out of my university without knowing the basics about gender research? What are we at Stanford doing wrong? So for one thing, you can take plenty of courses about gender from me in history, in the humanities, in the social sciences, but we don't integrate gender, sex and gender analysis in basic engineering courses, in basic computer science courses. And this is something that we're working on now. It's very hard to get those colleagues to integrate basic information about social issues, but that's what we're trying to do now so that we get a deeper fix. So again, products can be fixed, but what if Apple, Google, and other companies started product development by incorporating gender analysis? What innovative and new technologies could be conceived? So the point I want to make here as that this unconscious gender bias from the past, so from like 1968 and so on, is amplified into the future. So when a translation program defaults to he said, it reinforces the stereotype that men are active intellectuals by wiping out a woman in this role. It increases the relative frequency of the male pronoun on the web and reverses our hard won advances for gender equality. Now, it turns out that Google wanted to fix the problem, uh, and this was already in 2012, but they've been unable to. They did release a modest fix a couple of months ago, but it really was no good. It's often harder to fix a problem once the basic platform is set. So importantly, Google Translate creates the future. We know our technologies, our devices, our programs shape human attitudes, behaviors, and cultures. So in other words, this past bias is perpetuated into the future, even when governments, universities, and companies themselves have implemented policies to foster equality. So the big question is, how can we humans intervene in these automated processes to create the society we want? Now I'm going back to my slides for a minute. Since this example, uh, with Google Translate, we've gotten a lot of examples in uh, machine learning. So we know that algorithms are now very often biased. Uh, in July last year, was it July last year? Uh, a colleague and I um, published this comment in Nature, AI can be sexist and racist, it's time to make it fair. And we highlighted what I like to call here the two bride problem. It's another example of how unconscious bias is built into algorithms. And this is something we really need to be careful about. <clears throat> so this is an example of two brides. You have a typical North American bride here that we would all, we in the United States was, would all recognize it as a bride. And we have a typical North Indian bride here whom everyone in India would recognize as a bride. So in, uh, 
on the internet, this bride that looks like this, it looks like the, the bride dressed in white, is correctly labeled for computer vision, correctly labeled as a bride, as a dress, as a woman, as a wedding. But the photograph of the North Indian bride is incorrectly labeled as performance art, a costume, red. There's a cultural misunderstanding of the image. Now, why is this the case? Most of the problems for algorithms depend on the data set that it's trained on. So computer vision uses ImageNet, which is a very large uh, data set of 14 million labeled images. So when you search for some image on the internet, most likely you're relying on ImageNet and things have been labeled so you can find them. So the problem with this is that uh, images from the United States constitute 45% of this data set, whereas we are only 4% of the global population. And India is just over here in other. India uh, represents 36%, well, China and India together represent 36% of the world population, but only 3% of the images in this data set. So we need to make sure that our data sets appropriately represent geodiversity. Now, what is true of cultural bias is in these kinds of uh, data sets and algorithms is also true of ethnic bias. So uh, we have some recent applications of deep learning that have been successful in diagnosing skin cancer. So the idea is that you can use an app on your phone to diagnose a skin cancer early, and you can then go to treatment. So this was big news uh, last year. You know, oh, well, you can, you, know, you can diagnose skin cancer very early. But then a colleague and I started looking into the data set. The data set that this algorithm is based on uh, contains 130,000 images and it's dominated by white people, by European Americans. It includes very few images of people with darker skin and therefore we don't know if the algorithm works on darker skin. Now people will say, oh, but people with darker skin have fewer skin cancers. It's true, but they still do have skin cancer and therefore we must make sure that the algorithm works for everyone. So gendered innovations is solution based. We try to find solutions to all of these problems. Um, and we held a workshop in 2018 on machine learning. And uh, we had a team, an interdisciplinary team of computer scientists, lawyers, political scientists, historians, gender experts uh, it, to optimize algorithms that guarantee fairness. You can see some of our results in the nature comment that I noticed, but we also have a case study on the website called machine learning and you can see all of our results there. Now I could talk about many, many examples. We have 29 examples uh, on our case study, case study uh, on our website, case studies of where sex and gender analysis has really led to something new. So let me, um, I don't wanna talk too long. I want to hear your questions.